wonderful talk. Thank you. Okay, do you see my screen? Yeah, we see your screen, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, the introduction sounded very nice. I heard uh, pseudo-potential and I heard band theory of polarization and I heard topological insulators. So I guess you hit all of the, uh, all of the high points. Um, anyway, I'm very pleased uh, to be able to um, uh, give a couple of lectures. Um, uh, <clears throat> I uh, uh, arranged my talk into two, two lectures, as you uh, probably see from the abstracts. Uh, the first one is about the theory of electric polarization which goes back almost 30 years now. And uh, the second one um, is about ferroelectric materials. And these are somewhat related, but um, uh, independent topics. So uh, I'll stop after the first lecture and we'll have uh, questions and uh, a little break and then we'll uh, do the second lecture is, is my understanding. So this is a pedagogical uh, lecture. Um, my idea is to, um, uh, introduce uh, the what is now called the modern theory of polarization, although as I said it's not <laughs> it's not very modern anymore. Uh, some people are changing the name. Uh, so I'll discuss uh, what is the problem with the theory of polarization, um, what is the Berry phase formulation, and what is the Wannier center formulation. These two formulations turn out to be mathematically identical, uh, but the derivations and the motivations are, are different. And so it's nice that um, by two different paths, uh, one can arrive at what is essentially the same uh, formulation. Um, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll show some references. Uh, since the talk, talk is being recorded, you'll be able to get back to those, I guess, afterwards uh, very easily. So, you know, the school is uh, mostly focused on density functional theory, which is a set of uh, computational tools that allow us to, uh, 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 via the uh, cone sham density functional theory as a physical approximation, uh, we can calculate to good uh, accuracy, uh, ground state energies, uh, energies as a function of coordinates, forces, relaxed structures, phonons, and so on. And of course, uh, as you know, uh, uh, this theory is implemented in standard uh, codes such as Abinit and Quantum Espresso, which are open source codes. And then BASP is also a very widely used code, although it's um, uh, licensed. So uh, uh, at, the, at the time that the theory of polarization was developed, we knew how to calculate all of these things. Um, but there was something that we didn't know how to calculate um, that was uh, problematic and that was the electric polarization. Now, you probably know from elementary uh, textbook uh, definitions of uh, electric polarization, it's done in the context of a picture like uh, 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 shown on the left here, where you have little polarized entities with positive and negative dipole charges, uh, and then empty interstitial regions so that you can divide these uh, into uh, unit cells. And then you calculate the dipole moment divided by the cell volume uh, that has units of dipole density. And that's your definition of electric polarization. But the problem is that real materials don't behave like this. Real materials have positive point ions um, and um, uh, the electron charges are quantum, quantum mechanically distributed into uh, clouds uh, that have no, um, uh, uh, that are not separated um, into uh, separated regions. And um, this is a plot that was generated many years ago by um, uh, Nicola Marzari, uh, whose name I'm sure you also know. Um, the, uh, this is uh, for a material lead titanate that I'll talk about in the second talk. It's a material that we wanted to be able to calculate the electric polarization for. This is a a plot showing charge density in a color code on the left-hand uh, panel here. And then on the right-hand side, uh, he picked one particular uh, ISO contour of charge density and drew a, um, a rendering of that ISO contour. And so the point here is that there's no way of dividing the charge clouds into isolated entities whose dipole moment you can calculate independently. That's just not possible. Uh, so uh, we have to do something else. Um, uh, and uh, if you try to stick with the notion of defining 
uh, polarization as a dipole density per unit cell. And if you try to define dipole density in a naive way like this, pick a unit cell, integrate over the unit cell, compute uh, position times uh, charge density, integral D3R, that's the dipole mode of the unit cell. And then uh, the polarization would be this divided by uh, cell volume. Uh, so, but the problem is that the answer depends upon where I put the cell boundaries. If I put the cell boundary here, you can see that the dipole moment is approximately zero. If I uh, move the location of the unit cell and put it here, then I have excess positive charge at the top and negative charge at the bottom. The dipole moment points up and the dipole moment points down. And depending upon where I put the cell boundaries, I can get any answer I want. And there's no natural choice of cell boundaries. So if you uh, think about the problem uh, in more depth, um, uh, we and others uh, came to understand that even if you have a perfect knowledge of the charge density everywhere in the periodic unit cell in the interior of a bulk crystal, that's not enough information in principle to tell you uh, what the electric polarization is. Um, the electric polarization is somehow related to something that happens at the surfaces and um, uh, uh, it, it even raised the question initially whether there even was a bulk definition of, 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 of polarization. But uh, as we will see, there, there is. Uh, one way of saying what the problem is, is that when you're trying to do one of these uh, calculations of uh, dipole, you're multiplying a charge density times a position. Now, if I tried to do, the, uh, do that over the entire unit, uh, not over one unit cell, but over the entire crystal, I get nonsensical results because R blows up. And so uh, the, in, in some sense, the heart of the problem is that this quantity R times rho of R uh, is not a periodic function. It cannot be averaged over one unit cell in any meaningful way. And therefore the charge density itself is not enough to tell us the polarization. So if we go beyond the charge density, um, we can hope to uh, develop a formulation based on the wave functions, which carry more information than the charge density. So in a finite system, uh, you would do something like this. Uh, let's say you have a molecule uh, in a vacuum. Then uh, for each occupied uh, state of the molecule in density functional theory, you can calculate the expectation value of the position operator, uh, add them all up, and, and that gives the electronic contribution to the dipole, uh, dipole moment. Of course, you'd have to add the ionic contribution uh, and that would really be a dipole, not a polarization until you divide by a cell volume. Uh, so you'd like to do something like this, but again, the problem is that as you know, in a bulk crystalline solid, these wave functions, psi and k are block functions. They're labeled by wave vector k. And um, that's a problem. So, um, uh, if I try to, um, for example, uh, calculate the uh, expectation value of the position operator X in uh, one of these block functions, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk more about the cell periodic functions in a moment, but, but, but the point is that the X part here blows up um, so that you're actually uh, calculating the integral of something that blows up as X becomes very large and, um, and this kind of quantity is just not well-defined, uh, even if you try to uh, express it as, a, as an average per unit cell quantity, it's just hopelessly ill-defined. So that's essentially the same problem that we had before. Uh, so uh, how do we solve this problem? Well, <clears throat> um, there is a uh, careful uh, derivation that I've chosen not to present um, that you will find in some of the references later. Uh, in that derivation, uh, you imagine moving atoms and calculating the current that flows and integrating up the change in current using something called adiabatic perturbation theory. Um, for this pedagogical talk, I've decided to uh, present two uh, semi-intuitive heuristic uh, quote-unquote derivations, uh, not really convincing derivations, uh, but I uh, promise you that this has now been tested carefully and it works. Uh, the first of these is based on introducing very phases, and the second one is based on introducing 1A functions and 1A centers. So uh, let me start with the uh, very phase formulation. Uh, so first of all, uh, 
uh, in a slide or two, I just want to give a very basic uh, review of uh, solid state uh, physics. <clears throat> Suppose I have some uh, crystal like this. Uh, this happens to be barium titanate, which will appear in the second talk. And uh, I calculate the band structure. So uh, along some direction, let's say in K space, I calculate the energy bands and I have some occupied and some unoccupied bands. From the occupied bands, I can, um, uh, at each wave vector K, it's characterized by a, a block function. And the block function has an envelope function, E to the I K X uh, times some underlying wiggles. And uh, those wiggles correspond more or less to the uh, atomic wave functions that are being superposed to make up this uh, block function. Um, so uh, what we often do, um, and this is actually implemented in all the DFT codes, uh, we often work uh, not with the um, block function, which has this extra uh, envelope function um, attached to it, but we, we divide out uh, that envelope function to arrive at a cell periodic block function that's usually labeled UK, uh, which has the property of being periodic. So it has simple periodicity um, and it more or less looks like um, locally on atoms, it more, more or less looks like the atomic orbital, uh, whatever it is, S SPD orbital on some, on some atom. Um, but importantly, this uh, cell periodic uh, function um, it depends on wave vector K um, and it's periodic in space. Uh, now, uh, another thing about um, elementary uh, solid state physics, you know, the block theorem says that you can label the states by wave vector K. And so there's for a single band, you have some energy as a function of wave vector K. And if this is a one dimensional crystal, the wave vector K is just defined from minus pi over A to pi over A, that's called the first free one zone. And uh, if you somehow extend uh, into what's called the extended zone scheme, then um, this energy curve just keeps repeating uh, periodically. But this periodic repeat, you know, it's not just that a state uh, located here happens to have the same energy as a state located here. It's that this state and this state are the same state. Uh, these two different wave vectors label the same physical block state. So for example, if you're counting uh, occupied electrons, you would never occupy this one and this one separately because that would violate um, Pauli exclusion. So really um, a, a way to think about the first free one zone in a one dimensional system is not as an interval, but as a, as a closed loop. So I can change my point of view and instead of plotting energy vertically versus a horizontal segment, I can plot energy vertically versus a little closed circular loop in which, which labels the wave vector K going from zero to two pi over A as I go around the loop. And then I basically plot the band on a cylinder. Uh, and then uh, you know, I, I automatically um, uh, 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 remove the problem of, of duplicate labels. There's a, a unique label on the cylinder. Um, and I've just drawn one band here in general, there would be many energy bands and they'd be more complicated than the one I drew. But uh, <clears throat> the, the point uh, here is that because the band is now a loop in K space, as soon as you have a loop, you have the possibility of uh, various kinds of topological or what are called geometric quantities that can be defined in a way that can't be defined on an interval. Uh, so keep that thought in mind and we'll, we'll come back to it in a moment. So uh, I, I said before that if you try to define the polarization in terms of an expectation value of the position operator, this thing blows up to infinity, so that's no good. Um, here's an idea that um, is close to where we want to go. Oh dear, I, I skipped, a, uh, I want to do this. Here's an idea that's close to where we want to go. Uh, suppose I replace R by I times the gradient in K space. So this is the wave vector derivative or the wave vector gradient of the wave function. And the reason that I'm motivated to do this is you know that in ordinary quantum mechanics, the momentum operator um, is represented by minus I H bar times the spatial gradient operator. Well, the momentum is basically like wave vector. And uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in mechanics, uh, 
coordinate and uh, momentum are conjugate uh, variables. And so you can imagine turning it around and saying that um, heuristically, I can say that the coordinate operator can be replaced by i times a gradient with respect to wave vector. And if I do that, uh, I have something uh, a little bit different. Uh, this uh, substitution doesn't really work yet because if I use the ordinary block function psi n k here, then what happens is at very large x, uh, the uh, block function depends extremely rapidly on k. And so the gradient with respect to k blows up and is ill-conditioned. The problem basically is that different block functions psi n k for different wave vectors k obey different periodic boundary conditions on the unit cell. And therefore, uh, it's, not, um, uh, it's not very meaningful to try to take a derivative with respect to k on wave functions whose boundary conditions depend upon k. So the way to get rid of that, so that's also ill-defined. The way to get around that problem is to use the cell periodic wave functions. I can take a derivative with respect to wave vector of the cell periodic wave function. Uh, these uh, for all k have the same periodic boundary conditions, so that derivative is well defined. And if I make that heuristic substitution and write down a formula for the polarization, uh, lo and behold, uh, I get the uh, modern theory of polarization formula that um, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll come to in just a moment. Um, one way of seeing how we're uh, getting around this problem, um, although it's not directly related to the um, explanation I just gave you, but I think this is all also useful. Um, in some sense, the, the way to see that uh, this expression uh, that I got here is correct um, is um, to focus not on the polarization, but on the time derivative of the polarization. So suppose I have some crystal and I'm slowly moving one sublattice into a new location. And so I'm changing the polarization, the electric polarization. The change in polarization uh, with respect to time is a current. And I should be able to get that current by looking in one bulk unit cell and integrating the current that flows in one bulk unit cell and dividing by the cell volume. And I can do that because the current is a periodic function of a uh, coordinate. While what I was trying to do before, which is to consider r times rho, that is not. So if you focus on the current instead of the charge density, um, uh, you get a formulation um, that was introduced by Resta in 1992 that uh, started the developments that I'm talking about, which uh, in the simplest form said, let's focus on the change in polarization as I go from here to here. And that's going to be integrating up the current that flows uh, as a function of time. So we need an expression for dp dt, and it turns out you can show that the expression for dp dt is related uh, to this. So uh, I'm going to skip the uh, intervening steps, but basically uh, in 1993, a year later, uh, Dominic Kingsmith and I showed uh, that uh, mathematically and using uh, methods that had been introduced by David Thales, um, one can uh, uh, manipulate this expression and turn it into something that has this gradient with respect to wave vector acting on the cell periodic block function. And the I that was there, I, for some reason now the I is out front, but it's still, it's still there. Okay, so basically um, the, um, uh, the needed expression for the polarization uh, looks like this. It depends upon wave vector derivatives of the cell periodic block functions. So it's an unfamiliar formula. It looks kind of like an expectation value, but this psi k is not really an operator. It's really a derivative with respect to a label of the wave function, which is an unfamiliar uh, kind of expression. And uh, as, you, as we'll see, it also uh, introduces um, a, a, a quantum of uncertainty in the polarization um, um, that's associated with this. So again, uh, heuristically, what I've done is to replace the coordinate operator by i times the derivative with respect to wave vector. And when I do that, I can write the polarization. Uh, here, I've done it in three dimensions. Here, I'm doing it in a one-dimensional crystal. 
And it's convenient to write it as um, um, for one dimensions minus e times a, a, a phase variable phi over two pi, where the phase variable is given by this uh, formula. Because uh, this formula, uh, if you uh, know what a Berry phase is, you'll recognize that uh, that's a Berry phase. Uh, I'll, I'll explain what a Berry phase is on the next slide. But, but just to complete the thought, uh, what, uh, what happens is that uh, if I regard the band as a closed loop on the one-dimensional V1 zone regarded as a circle, and I do a loop integral of this um, UK D by DK UK object, uh, I get something which is called the Berry phase, and the polarization is just proportional uh, to the Berry phase. Okay, so let me explain what a Berry phase is. Uh, you may have seen this before in some context. Um, here, I'm imagining um, that I have some uh, state uh, of a system, uh, you know, in some other context, the system might be something like a, a molecule. Uh, lambda is a parameter which might describe, for example, the distance between two atoms that I'm varying by hand uh, and some other atoms. And, um, and so I, I take the system around in a loop. For example, I move some atom to the right and then up and then left and then down, come around in a closed loop. And I parameterize this with lambda as a continuous parameter going from zero to one. And um, <clears throat> at each point on this loop, I calculate the ground state of the system. Uh, that's this uh, u lambda. And then I compute this object. Uh, it's the derivative of u lambda with respect to lambda, which I also have been writing this way. These are just identical things in a slightly different notation. And um, you can either put the I or do the imaginary part. You know, here I have the imaginary part, but basically you do the loop integral. Uh, this is uh, what we call the Berry phase. And why is this a useful thing to do? Uh, it's a useful thing to do. First of all, I should point out that uh, at different points along this loop, at different lambda, um, the, uh, the phase of this wave function at each different lambda is free. I can take any wave function multiply it by an overall phase, and it still represents the same physical state. So uh, that freedom is called the gauge freedom. But this uh, object, uh, this Berry phase, is well-defined in spite of that gauge freedom. If I change that gauge, then, then phi does not change, or at least it does not change modulo 2 pi, which means it does not change if I regard it as a, as a phase angle. So uh, let me explain that uh, mathematically. Uh, so again, what do I mean by a change of gauge? I, I start by uh, defining some set of u lambda along this continuous path where lambda goes from zero to one as I go around the loop. Um, <clears throat> and now I make a new choice of wave functions that I call u tilde, which are related to the old ones by a lambda dependent uh, phase factor. Here beta is real, so this is a pure phase. It lives on the unit circle. And, and beta is some function of lambda as I go around the circle. And if you think about what beta can look like, um, let's say uh, I, I twist the phase uh, here, I twist the phase a little bit and then go back. It, it has to come back to itself when I get all the way around to lambda equals one, uh, because I want the uh, wave function again to be smooth across this junction. Um, but importantly, it doesn't exactly have to come back to itself. It could come back to itself with a difference of two pi. Because if I take e to the i times two pi, that's just one. And so it would again be smooth here. And I could have, uh, so the integer m uh, determines whether it comes back directly or shifted by two pi uh, uh, once or shifted by two pi twice would be m equals two and so on. So in other words, beta of one minus beta of uh, zero has to be two pi m where m is some integer in order for the, um, wave functions to remain smooth here. And so if I impose that constraint and calculate uh, the Berry phase of the new wave functions, uh, what I find is it's the same as it was for the old wave functions uh, plus two pi times this integer. And the, um, uh, the proof of this, uh, I'll just do very quickly. Uh, you see what happens is that the lambda derivative acts in two places. In green, it acts back on the U which reproduces the very phase phi of the uh, original states. And in red, the derivative x on the uh, phase twist 
and it brings down a factor of d beta d lambda, and then this u lambda u lambda is just one. So you're basically just integrating uh, d beta d lambda d lambda, which which gives you two pi m. So uh, so that's the that's the proof. But uh, the important thing to take away from this is that this um, this formula, this very phase formula for a closed loop, has the property that it defines an object which is uh, gauge invariant regarded as a uh, as a phase angle. In other words, depending upon how you assign the, the gauge, you might calculate, let's say, you might calculate pi over two or five pi over two. But if I plot that on the unit circle, they're exactly the same point on the unit circle, regarded as a phase angle and using standard conventions, I would call it you know, pi over two, not five pi over two and so on. Well, actually this looks like a little bit less. This looks like, uh, uh, about 70 degrees. So 70 degrees and 430 degrees are really the same thing. Um, a famous example of a Berry phase. So uh, again, uh, at the moment, I've stepped away from band theory, and this could be any system whose ground state depends upon lambda. A famous example is a spinner in a magnetic field. I have that my system is just a single isolated uh, electron or, or, or proton. Uh, which has a, a magnetic moment. And um, if you apply a magnetic field, the ground state um, uh, is a spin up in the direction of the magnetic field. And um, the higher energy state is spin down in the direction of the field. And if I uh, carry the magnetic field around in a closed loop and back to itself, I, uh, I can compute the Berry phase of this spinner ground state wave function as I do that. And um, famously, the uh, answer that is obtained is that the Berry phase is nothing other than the solid angle subtended by the path in magnetic field orientation space divided by two. Um, so uh, that's a famous example of a Berry phase, um, not directly in the context of uh, band theory. Uh, in band theory, what we do is we replace the uh, lambda that appeared here, which is an arbitrary parameter, is now replaced by the uh, wave vector, which is the parameter that lives on the unit circle in the Brillouin zone, the first Brillouin zone uh, for a 1D, 1D system. And so <clears throat> we have a set of uh, states whose block functions depend upon wave vector lambda. We calculate the Berry phase from the cell periodic uh, block functions um, and um, multiply by you know, minus E because that's the electron charge and then phi over two pi, excuse me, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, the, is the phase angle divided by two pi. So it goes from zero to one. And that's the contribution of the electrons to the polarization. By the way, there's also a contribution of the ions, which um, is more or less trivial, so I haven't been focusing on it. So you have to add both of them together, uh, <clears throat> considering a neutral system, to get a meaningful answer. Uh, so, uh, but the, the thing to keep in mind here is that because this um, Berry phase uh, is um, only well-defined to pi, so for example, I said that pi over two and five pi over two are really the same thing, that may make you wonder about uh, this polarization. It means that the polarization uh, you know, could be uh, minus E over four or minus five fourths E over four. And that's the same thing. In other words, I can change the polarization by a quantum E and still be uh, represented by the same phase angle for this Berry phase. So I'll explain why that is when I look at the Wannier um, function representation. Before I leave this part, uh, just to uh, say a word about how this is implemented in three dimensions in first principles codes like Abinit and VASP and Quantum Espresso. Uh, the way it's done is um, uh, the polarization in general has three components, three Cartesian components corresponding to three orthogonal uh, real space lattice vectors that are labeled by J uh, equals one, two, three in this. And so for J equals one, that's along the X direction. What, you, what the codes do is set up a string of K points in the X direction and calculate the Berry phase uh, along each string. 
and then average uh, those berry phases over a two-dimensional k-mesh in a manner that's similar to the way everything else is averaged in density functional theory. So normally in density functional theory, you would average everything over a three-dimensional k-mesh. Here, you calculate px, the x component, by averaging over ky and kz. And for each ky, kz, you calculate the berry phase along a, a path in a case space like that. So it's a slightly different uh, arrangement, but it's actually quite efficient and, and, and relatively straightforward to do. So when all the codes uh, have an ability to calculate um, this polarization and report it for you, uh, here's one uh, application, uh, uh, again, uh, borrowing materials that will appear in the next talk. These are perovskite ferroelectrics. Um, this atom in the middle, let's say, is a titanium atom. And suppose that I displace all the titanium atoms uh, upward a little bit and calculate the change in polarization divided by the distance by which that sublattice is displaced. That quantity is called the dynamical effective charge. And it's well known uh, experimentally in many of these materials because it's related to infrared uh, absorption um, of electromagnetic radiation in the phonon uh, frequency range. Um, in any case, um, Naively, from a chemical point of view, you would expect that if you move a barium atom, a barium is nominally a plus two ion, titanium is nominally plus four, oxygen is nominally minus two. Um, but if you move these atoms in the vertical direction and use that berry phase formula to calculate the change in polarization and calculate the dynamical charges, uh, you get something uh, quite, uh, quite different and quite interesting. The dynamical charge of barium well, it's not so far from two. It's a little more, but it's not enormous. But look at look at titanium. Titanium uh, has a nominal charge of four, but the dynamical charge is, is, is more than seven. So basically what happens is that the titanium core is a plus four core, and I move that upwards. But when I do that, I suck electrons downwards. And so electrons on the neighboring oxygen atom uh, move into the bond with the titanium. And so I move positive charge up and negative charge down, and that gives me an anomalous, this is called an anomalous dynamical effective charge. And also for the oxygen, uh, the apical oxygen has an enormous um, uh, enhanced uh, dynamical uh, effective charge. Okay, I, I wanna go on uh, to the discussion in terms of 1A functions. So let me summarize uh, where we are, and I'll ask for questions at the end of the talk. Um, so uh, polarization cannot be expressed in terms of the bulk charge density, even if you have a perfect knowledge of it. Um, it can be expressed in terms of the, of the berry phases of the block bands, and this provides a practical approach to the calculation of the polarization. Uh, but it, it's still not very intuitive to most people what this berry phase is. And so I think this second formulation, which is the 1A function formulation, is uh, more intuitive and um, gives you a better physical picture of what's going on. So uh, what is a 1A function? Uh, the basic idea, I, I mentioned before that the block function has an envelope times an underlying uh, cell, cell periodic part, but it basically looks like a, a, a kind of a wave. And you know from uh, elementary physics that if you superpose waves of slightly different wave vector, you get a wave packet. And if you superpose waves of a very broad distribution in K space uh, of, uh, of waves, you get a relatively narrow um, uh, object in real space. And if you want to get a localized, as localized as possible, then you want to average over as many wave vectors as possible. And uh, in crystals, the wave vector runs on the, on the unit circle. And so you want to average over all of the all of the wave vectors on the unit circle. So uh, the way it goes is something like this. Again, suppose I have some cubic crystal and um, this is the uh, Brewan zone as uh, wave vector Kx uh, goes uh, across the Brewan zone uh, in, the, in the Kx direction. And um, if I uh, make, a, uh, make a supercell or imagine a supercell, uh, that is six times repeated in the horizontal direction, and I impose overall periodic boundary conditions on the entire supercell, then that induces a k-point mesh. So a k-point mesh can always be thought of as representing 
uh, a supercell size in real space. So this is k-space, this is real space. If I pick one of these, um, of course, if I pick the wave function at k equals zero, then it sort of equally um, uh, goes all along um, in, in that real space. If I pick one of these other wave vectors, then there's an envelope function uh, times the underlying wave functions. And so I can make a wave packet by summing up uh, some of these things. If I sum up all six of them with equal amplitude, making as much use as of the full Brewen zone as I can in, in K space so that it will be as localized as possible in real space, then what happens is when I add up these different wave functions, they, um, they add up and give a large contribution in the central cell. This is the cell in real space at zero. Uh, but then all the, you know, elsewhere, I get phase cancellation from these different uh, states. And so if I do the sum of all six of these block functions, uh, what happens is that I get a function which is well localized. Well, it has some tails, um, ultimately exponentially um, decaying tails um, uh, when you do this on a continuum. But anyway, you get a localized wave function in the home unit cell, the unit cell at r equals zero. Uh, so I've got uh, a wave function. It's not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian anymore. It's a linear combination of occupied eigenstates of the wave uh, uh, of the Hamiltonian, um, and um, it by itself doesn't represent this whole band, but I can make uh, Im images of it. For example, if I take this function and translate it by three unit cells, it turns out that I can obtain this 1A function uh, again by taking a linear combination of these six states, but with extra phase factors that depend upon wave vector k and depend upon the lattice vector r at which I'm doing the construction. So if r equals zero, this factor is, is absent and I generate the 1A function in the home cell. And so if I do this for all different uh, lattice vectors, I generate six different 1A functions. And now what I've done is made six localized states which span the same Hilbert space as six block states. And so they're an equally good representation of the ground state charge density uh, and other properties as the block states. Um, so that's the basic idea of the 1A functions. If you, if you follow the mathematics of what was done here, it turns out that this is really nothing other than a Fourier transform. It's a Fourier transform with respect to wave vector k of the block states into something that are uh, localized, uh, localized functions. Um, another way of thinking about it is it's a unitary transformation from the block states to a set of localized states. Um, in general, what happens is you have a, a, a continuum of K, which goes to an infinite array, infinite periodic array of 1A functions. And you have one set of 1A functions like this for each occupied band. So if you have four occupied bands, then you have four occupied 1A functions in each unit cell. But for this talk, I'll just imagine that there's only one because it's easier to think about. Now, an interesting thing about the 1A functions is because they're localized, <clears throat> I can calculate dipole moments of 1A functions. So I can calculate the integral uh, over a 1A function of r uh, times, I, I can calculate uh, an expectation value of this. Uh, this is the 1A function in the home unit cell, that's what the zero means, times the coordinate operator times the 1A function in the home unit cell. I couldn't do that for the block functions because they extend to infinity, but the 1A functions are exponentially localized around uh, one unit cell. And so that is a well-defined object. And if I do a little uh, algebra to see what uh, mathematical representation is given uh, to this uh, expectation value of the position operator, it's like the center of charge of the 1A function, if you like. Well, uh, here's uh, the expression for the 1A function uh, in the home unit cell. Uh, written out in terms of the cell periodic block functions. Uh, if I multiply by r, I can uh, replace, oops, I can replace e to the i k dot r by minus i gradient with respect to k e to the i k dot r because this thing acting on e to the i k dot r brings down the r that I want. Then I do an integration by parts so that the gradient acts on the uk instead. Uh, so there was a sign change from minus i to plus i because of the integration by parts. And then I come along with the 1a function as a bra and take the expectation value, and I get this formula. 
and, and now you recognize this formula. In one dimension, this would be UK, D by DK, UK. Oh, that's a very, that's a very phase. So the center of charge of the 1A function is essentially the same thing as uh, the very phase. So let me explain it a little bit more. Suppose I have some simple one-dimensional crystal and the ions are located at zero and A and two A and so on. Uh, and the ions are plus one. And I have uh, one 1A one function in the unit cell, just one spin. And it's uh, one A center is located where I put this minus sign. It's the center of charge of this one A function. And I can calculate the electric polarization by saying, okay, now I do know how to calculate the dipole moment of the unit cell. I take this to be my contents of the unit cell and I calculate its dipole moment. And then I divide by the, the cell length, which is A. And when I do that, well, this is a three dimensional expression, but anyway, when I do that, I get uh, exactly the expression for polarization in terms of the Berry phase. Now, remember I said that the uh, Berry phase expression in some sense uh, introduced an uncertainty in the polarization modulo uh, a quantum because the Berry phase can change by two pi. And that corresponds to the fact that I have different possible choices about which 1A center I should associate with which ion. If instead I say that the contents of my unit cell correspond to this negative charge at the left and the positive charge at the right, now the polarization is pointing to the right and I get an apparently different answer, but the answers are, are only different in the sense that the uh, choice of Berry phase uh, was changed by, by two pi. So you might ask, well, what is the right answer? Is the right answer this one or is the right answer this one? And uh, <laughs> the answer is that they're both right. Um, so uh, depending upon how you look at things, uh, it could be one or the other. And um, you have to think about uh, what you want to uh, predict based on the polarization. For example, uh, if what you're trying to predict is the change in polarization as you move a sublattice, then uh, regardless of whether I follow uh, this uh, polarization definition or this one, <clears throat> the change will be the same. And so I'll get the same answer at the end. The current that flows will be the same. Um, uh, there is a difference in terms of what appears at the surface but that more or less corresponds to the fact that the surface itself might have this positive charge here or might not have the positive charge here. So in some sense, the surface uh, charge density, which is related to the polarization, also has the same uncertainty. Okay, so I, uh, I, I, I do wanna leave lots of time for uh, questions and, uh, and for a little break. Um, so I, I know this went a little bit uh, quickly, um, I'm hoping that some of you may have been exposed to, to some of this before. Uh, if not, if it's a first time, it gives you a feeling for uh, what the theory uh, looks like. And uh, let me uh, just quickly run through some references. I'll do this quickly because I assume that you will have access to the recording. And so uh, you can, uh, or you can snap these uh, yeah, from your screen or, or whatever. Uh, these are the original uh, references, the rest of paper that got, got it started, uh, two papers by uh, Kingsmith and myself um, that introduced uh, the Berry phase um, explicitly. Um, there's a, a Reviews of Modern Theory, uh, Reviews of Modern Physics paper by Resta in 1994 that came soon afterwards, which uh, was the initial um, uh, uh, go-to review paper that everybody referred to. Um, uh, there were two uh, uh, chapters of books that uh, Rafaela and I collaborated on. Um, you can find these on my website publication list. And if you, if you can't download the uh, PDF, uh, send me an email. I think one of them um, <clears throat> you have to request because of the copyright. But if you request it from me, I'll send it to you. And uh, uh, th uh, I want to advertise my book that came out about three years ago, uh, Berry Phases in Electronic Structure Theory. Um, uh, by the way, if some of you are um, listening from Japan, uh, there's a Japanese translation which is currently uh, being worked on, uh, which I'm thrilled about. Um, so for this particular discussion, chapter three and four mainly, um, and then uh, I wanna mention these uh, pedagogical things by Nicola Spalden, um, a 2012 paper, and then a very nice set of YouTube videos 
that goes through the problem of the modern the theory of polarization very clearly and very slowly, step by step, all on YouTube. Uh, so uh, I recommend that. And then uh, finally, about uh, Wadier functions, these are the uh, sort of uh, initial uh, reference. Uh, the Reviews of Modern Physics paper that's uh, very widely uh, uh, referenced about Wannier functions, the Wannier 90 code package, and again, the Wannier 90 code package, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, which is used for explicitly generating Wannier functions, although you don't need to use the Wannier 90 code package in order to calculate polarization. So um, I'll stop there. Uh, again, um, the uh, problem of electric polarization is subtle to formulate correctly. It was not formulated correctly until about 30 years ago. Um, it cannot be expressed directly in terms of charge density or directly as an operator expectation value as most of the other things that we know about in physics. Instead, it can be expressed equivalently in terms of Berry phases or in terms of Wannier function centers. Um, and uh, you can calculate it using standard codes but it is important to understand something about the underlying theory and particularly about how to interpret this quantum of uncertainty um, in, the, uh, in the definition of polarization uh, in order to use it properly. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, see if there are questions and maybe we'll have time for a little break before I start the, the second talk. So, so thanks very much. Thank you very much for the very nice and uh, uh, clear, wonderful talk. Uh, let's take some questions if there are any. So, uh, 학생들은 그 질문 있으면 채팅창에 질문 올려주셔도 되고요. 안녕하세요. <laughs> Oh, something in the chat. Okay, yeah. So, his name is Yana. Yani Nose Kunihiro. So, ah, uh, oh, that's a nice question. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. And uh, the question is suppose uh, that we have a system that does look like the textbook, where you have something like molecules um, uh, uh, with a vacuum in between. Um, how is it that the uh, wave vector derivative, uh, 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 how is it that when you calculate the polarization using this wave vector derivative formula um, that you get, um, uh, that you get um, something um, that looks like a dipole moment? I, I wonder if I should, uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's worth just, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to open my um, iPad and, and, and draw there. I think it's better. So let's hope this works. I'll share again. I'll do iPad airplay. No. What am I doing? Mm. Okay, just a minute. Okay, so um, the thing is that the, the block function looks like e to the minus i kx times the um, cell periodic block function. So if I have a, can you see? You can see, right? Yeah, we can see, yeah. <laughs> so I have a molecule uh, and it's surrounded by vacuum. Uh, then uh, in the unit cell, the uh, block function uh, actually does not have any dependence upon wave vector k. It just looks like a molecular uh, wave function. But then I multiply it by the phase factor. And then when I take d by dk of u of k, this derivative doesn't act on uh, the wave function at all, the block function at all inside this region. 
but it does act here and it gives you a minus i e to the minus i k x uh, times the psi, psi of x. And, um, and so um, you end up multiplying by, by x. And so you do actually correctly calculate um, a, a charge density uh, when you calculate the, so of course, when you multiply this by another UK, then this uh, phase factor disappears and I get something that looks like x times psi of x squared. So I end up integrating. And so it does look like a dipole moment. So again, the trick is that you have to use the cell periodic function, not the block function. It has this extra k derivative behavior, which represents the x. So uh, that's, the, that's the answer to the question in the, in the chat. So you must be really helpful to uh, all the students here now. So there's another question. Uh, we'll raise the hands maybe. Uh, thank you for easy and intuitive lecture. I'm a PhD student in Seoul National University. So when I use bus to calculate dielectric constant, I saw it make finite displacement of ions. And I heard you that uh, you, when you calculate very phase, you make displacements on ions. So why is finite displacements necessary to calculate very phase? I, um, when I uh, hear the lecture, uh, uh, I don't see uh, why the displacement is needed. Um. Well, at, at the end of the day, the, the, the careful formulation of the problem is that, you know, you have some, some uh, crystal uh, with some ions and some charge density. And then uh, over time, some uh, period of time, you slowly adiabatically change it so that maybe, um, you know, uh, the ions have changed position. And I want to imagine that these are both uh, periodic systems. So I, I, I move a sublattice and I want to calculate the change of uh, polarization. Now, it turns out that the derivative of polarization with respect to displacing one of the atomic coordinates. So this is, I'm trying to write derivative of polarization or really a partial derivative with respect to R mu is a, is a coordinate of one of the sublattices of the atoms. Um, it's been known how to do this from linear response theory um, uh, for uh, a long time, uh, 50 years maybe. Um, uh, and uh, in the density functional context, this was done by Baroni and co-workers and Gomes and co-workers. And so it's actually relatively easy to calculate the derivative of polarization with respect to displacement using direct linear response theory. Uh, so um, that was actually implemented before the modern theory of polarization. If you wanted to do it using the modern theory of polarization, the way you would do it is you make a, a finite displacement, you calculate the Berry phase polarization before and after, and then you, then you take the difference and then you take the limit that delta R goes, goes to zero. So, so you're right that actually the, the Z stars uh, could have been calculated. This is this is known as a dynamical effective charge. The Z stars could be calculated before the modern theory of polarization. So, when I used the calculation of Z stars as an example, uh, it was a little bit uh, uh, a little bit uh, artificial. Uh, actually, um, uh, it turned out that the first calculation of uh, dynamical effective charges. Um, uh, by finite differences was done by Resta um, very soon after the King Smith Vanderbilt papers. And it was done not in a plane wave code, but in a uh, LMTO or uh, something, um, LAPW, uh, anyway, an all electron code. In the all electron codes in those days, uh, the linear response was not available. It was too difficult to do for the all electron codes. But the uh, finite difference very phase calculation was easy to do. And um, 
Uh, so for at least for those people, it was a big advantage to be able to use the finite difference. But if your comment was that the linear response is just as good or better than the finite difference, I agree. And actually at the end of the day, the, the linear response formula is the one that is used to do a careful formal derivation of the formulas that I presented. If there is no more questions. The chatting, Okay, I'll read it. I have, oh, wait a minute. Um, I missed this one. If the periodicity of the lattice is broken, for example, by external fields, then we cannot represent by, by the, block function, the block wave function. In, in such cases, how does polarization be calculated? Um, well, that's another lecture. Um, <laughs> there, uh, there, there is a formulation uh, for uh, how to compute the properties of an insulator in a finite electric field that was developed, uh, I think it was uh, in the early 2000s, late 1900, 1998, 2002, I don't remember exactly when. And, and basically the idea is you, you write down that the total energy is the usual uh, cone sham uh, energy, which is a, 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 a functional of all of, the, uh, all of the block wave functions, minus uh, polarization uh, dot uh, electric field. I'll use curly E for electric field to distinguish between energy, right? And this is the very phase polarization. And so, uh, if I take this to be my energy functional, and now you know I take the, the derivative of this total energy with respect to a wave function has to vanish, and I find the the uh, you know minimal uh, minimizing equations, I get a modified uh, cone sham theory. Um, this is a tricky theory because the electric field can't be too strong or it uh, fails, and. Um, uh, and also, um, unlike ordinary cone sham theory, um, uh, you have to include terms that couple neighboring k points in the self consistent uh, calculation. You can't treat each k point independently anymore. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but, but once you've done that, essentially what you one way of looking at what you're doing in the 1A representation, if you think in the 1A representation, you apply an electric field, the 1A functions get distorted uh, by the electric field and they generate a new set of block functions. So what are those block functions? They're not eigenstates of the Hamiltonian because once you have an electric field, um, the eigenstates are horrible things, some kind of terrible airy functions or something. Um, but nevertheless, the those quote unquote block functions, um, the manifold of them represents a one particle density matrix, which is periodic and uh, idempotent and, um, uh, and minimizes the energy in the presence of uh, the Hamiltonian and the external electric field. Uh, and so it's still a meaningful thing. So I can see that there's a couple more questions and I'm not sure how many of these you want me to get to. Maybe I should get to. Yeah, but the one last question is about uh, ferroelectricity. So maybe you can take some rest and then after the second lecture, maybe you can finish up the, the questions, final questions. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, so <laughs> please take some rest. You must be tired, getting tired. <laughs> okay. So maybe. Uh, five minutes? Five minutes, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll see you again in five minutes. Okay, very good. Thank you.
Okay, the second lecture will be about ferroelectric uh, materials. Uh, so, uh, maybe please get started and uh, we uh, will uh, talk about the rest of the final questions uh, at the end. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the uh, topics that uh, we have worked in worked on in my group over the years is um, uh, uh, theory of uh, ferroelectric and pie piezoelectric materials, um, and uh, I, I can't begin to cover everything that we've uh, done. But uh, what I'd like to do is um, introduce uh, what is uh, what is meant by a ferroelectric and what is meant by a piezoelectric and um, uh, discuss uh, something about uh, how first principles calculations uh, can be used to describe these um, objects, these kinds of materials. Um, the, um, uh, the, uh, so the first part will be uh, an extended introduction. And then I'll uh, talk about um, very early applications that we did um, to uh, bulk perovskites, explaining how uh, we do both zero temperature calculations, which is the standard uh, thing that is done in most DFT calculations. But for the ferroelectric phase transitions, it's very important to include finite temperature, non-zero temperature. And so I'll say a little bit about uh, how we use the first principles calculations to build models that are used to study the finite temperature properties. And then, um, as I have, if I have time, uh, there are two topics that I wanted to talk about that are uh, more recent work. Uh, one is on uh, a certain class of novel hexagonal uh, ferroelectrics. Um, um, and the second one uh, has to do with switching in a class of corundum structure uh, ferroelectrics, including lithium niobate. Um, and <clears throat> both of these projects were part of a generic search for new ferroelectric and piezoelectric materials that might have some uh, uh, improved um, uh, properties for certain purposes. Uh, so then I'll uh, summarize at the end. So, um, so what is a, a ferroelectric? Let me illustrate this with the best known class of ferroelectrics, which are the uh, cubic perovskites. So the perovskite crystal structure um, has a formula ABO3 where A and B are cations and O is oxygen. So the A atoms uh, are on the corners of a simple cubic structure. The oxygen atoms are on the faces, the six faces, well, really three faces when you take account of uh, periodicity. And then um, there's a, um, a B a cation, which is almost always a transition metal, a cation like titanium or zirconium that sits at or near uh, the center of this oxygen octahedron. And <clears throat> this class of materials uh, is uh, very wide. Um, I've mentioned here uh, four materials that are um, well-known uh, ferroelectrics or near ferroelectrics. But this class of materials also has a huge number of other materials like vanadates and so, and, and so on um, that um, have other uh, uses. But focusing for the moment on uh, ones like barium titanate, so I'll use barium titanate as my uh, canonical example. So this is a titanium atom in the center. So in some of these materials, if I would plot the energy as a function of moving this uh, titanium atom up and down. And so as I move it up and down, the, the Z component of polarization, this is really PZ, the Z component of polarization um, uh, uh, changes. And if I plot the energy as a function of that polarization, I have two possibilities. I have a single well potential with a minimum at the origin, and I have a double well potential um, with the uh, minimum uh, displaced from the center. So if the minimum is uh, at the center, uh, this is a high symmetry. The ground state structure is the simple cubic structure. It has no polarization because it's centrosymmetric. And we call this the paraelectric structure. But 
if it happens that the energy is lower when the titanium is displaced, here it's displaced upwards, so the polarization is in the positive direction. It could be displaced the other way. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't move the atom down in my drawing, but imagine that the atom is going down instead of up. Then you have the other, other value of polarization, so you have this double well. Um, in this class of materials, um, the uh, transition metal ions are often at the boundary, close to the boundary between these two behaviors. And so um, if they're in the paraelectric phase, it, it doesn't really look much like a parabola. It looks like a flat, a, a flat bottom uh, parabola to some degree. Uh, so um, if, if the material has this property that uh, the titanium atom likes to be displaced in the ground state, we call it a ferroelectric because it has two states, polar up and polar down, um, that we can switch between by applying an external electric field. Actually, because of the cubic symmetry, they're not two states, but six states, because it can also displace in the plus and minus x direction or the plus and minus y direction. Um, so I, I mentioned that there's a very large class of these uh, materials. And in this slide, I just mentioned some of the other things. Uh, many of them are magnetic. Some of them are both magnetic and polar. Some of them are superconducting. Some of them are mod insulators. They have metal insulator transitions. But I'm not going to talk about any of that in this talk. I'll just talk about the two um, properties that I mentioned at the beginning, which is ferroelectricity and piezoelectricity. So ferroelectricity, because I have two states, let's imagine I just have two states. So I have polar up and polar down. I can think of that as a bit. And so one application for ferroelectrics is as solid state memories. And these would be non-volatile memories. The idea is uh, you have something like an ordinary uh, field effect transistor, except you replace the uh, gate dielectric with a ferroelectric, which can either polarize uh, down or polarize up, uh, depending upon how its state is set uh, by this external uh, electro uh, world line. And, 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 and that state will be non-volatile because the, once you switch, switch the polarization, it will stay in the state that it was switched to. And that will either turn on or turn off this uh, channel underneath. So this uh, technology has successfully been implemented in non-volatile solid state memories. Uh, it so far has only appeared in niche applications because flash silicon-based memories are so inexpensive and successful that these ferroelectric memories got outcompeted, um, but uh, they still do exist in some uh, niche applications because of uh, particular um, uh, properties having to do with um, uh, response time and, and, and so on. Um, so uh, that's a potential uh, ferroelectric memory application what is piezoelectricity and what are the applications of piezoelectricity? This is where these materials are really used um, in our world as piezoelectrics. So what is piezoelectricity? Uh, a piezoelectric material is one that has the property that if you apply a stress, so for example, you apply uh, uh, squeezing in the vertical direction, then as the material gets compressed, it generates a uh, charge on the surfaces, which comes from a polarization which is generated in the interior by the, um, by the stress or strain. Conversely, if I have a material and it's got a top uh, and bottom uh, capacitor plate and I apply a voltage across it, uh, it will expand or shrink. And so the strain will respond to a voltage or the uh, polarization will respond to a stress. These are really um, two sides of the same coin uh, these are converse, direct and converse effects. So if the first one exists, the second one it must exist, and they're described by the same uh, piezoelectric constant. So that's basically what piezoelectricity is. Uh, how is it connected to ferroelectricity? Well, uh, uh, you can have a piezoelectricity in almost any polar material, because if you have a polarization and you apply strain, it will affect the polarization at least a little bit. But in ferroelectrics, you typically have this situation. You're near a ferroelectric phase transition, which means that uh, in the absence of any external pressure, 
uh, this material, let's say, I didn't mean to do that. This material would be ferroelectric, which means that the titanium atom would prefer to be up uh, and with a positive polarization. But it turns out that uh, if you apply pressure and the pressure uh, that's enough to, let's say, shrink the lattice constant by 1% is more than enough to put you past this uh, phase transition where the titanium atom prefers to stay in the center. So what that means is that there's a region just before you uh, get the titanium atom in its equilibrium position where the slope of this curve, the dp with respect to strain, the strain derivative of the polarization is very large. And so um, that makes it a, a very um, high piezoelectric material. So for example, zinc oxide is piezoelectric, but it's not ferroelectric. It's not near a phase transition. It doesn't, it is piezoelectric, but it doesn't have a huge piezoelectric constant, but something like lead titanate or barium titanate has a much larger one. And um, these are built into the medical ultrasound uh, imaging devices that uh, we um, have uh, in our modern world now. Uh, for example, uh, it's the same technology as in Navy sonar, but um, the medical application is on a much smaller length scale. You have these uh, transducer arrays, um, electric uh, voltages are applied to pairs of electrodes which generate um, uh, strains, which generate ultrasonic waves, which travel out through the head of the device into the tissue of the person um, uh, who is being imaged, and then you have waves getting reflected back. When the waves get reflected back, the, the very same arrays act as detectors because the strain coming in the reflected wave generates electric voltages, which are then detected. So the same ar arrays can be used both to send out the waves and to uh, detect the receiving waves and the um, uh, ability to do this with high fidelity um, uh, is en enabled by having piezoelectric materials with a high uh, piezoelectric constant. Uh, by the way, there are also applications where these trans transducers generate such intense ultrasound beams that they can do surgery. They can kill cells, uh, you know, in some tumor inside uh, a, a piece of tissue, for example. And this is uh, one of the applications as well. This is a, a funny application, uh, energy harvesting. Uh, so if you put uh, uh, a lot of piezoelectric sensors under the feet of passengers coming through the toll station in a subway station in Tokyo, uh, the uh, pressure generates electrical impulses, which generates electricity, which is used to power the electronics in the turnstiles, so they don't need any external power. And a similar thing can be used to harvest energy from traffic going over bridges, as is done in this bridge over Sydney Harbor in Australia. Uh, and then on a different length scale, you can use these piezoelectric transducers as little actuators that can make little, little uh, uh, artificial insects uh, flap their wings and, and so on. So. Anyway, so we would like to have a theory that we can use to calculate these uh, ferroelectric and piezoelectric properties. And density functional theory is um, an excellent candidate because it's generally accurate, predictive, chemically specific, computationally tractable, and we can isolate um, effects of uh, various things that we're uh, interested in. Um, temperature is a tricky one for density functional theory, as I'll say in a little bit. Um, I prepared these slides for another talk. I think you covered what density functional theory is so far in this school, so I'll assume so. Uh, it's implemented in standard packages, uh, usually in a plane wave basis. And uh, so let me move on and talk about um, these uh, three applications that I, I have in mind. So the first goes back to these uh, bulk uh, perovskites like barium titanate. So um, uh, barium, titanate, barium titanate is uh, well characterized experimentally. Um, uh, uh, I'll talk about different uh, structural phases in a moment, but the tetragonal phase is the one where the uh, titanium atom goes in the vertical direction 
uh, after it does that, the C lattice constant is a little bit larger than the A lattice constant by about 1%. Um, uh, and the, um, uh, um, uh, and the uh, experimental numbers are uh, given in the top row and the theoretical numbers are given in the bottom row. The, um, the three uh, lattice constants in this calculation were fixed the, to the experimental uh, A and C and volume. You don't get very different results, but it turns out that you know, lattice constants are under, underestimated a little bit in ordinary DFT, overestimated a little bit in gradient corrected DFT. Um, uh, we found that the best results are obtained if we actually fix the lattice constants to be the experimental ones. But then these are the th theoretical internal coordinates uh, in lattice units, and these are the in experimental internal coordinates in lattice units. So you see we get a very good agreement. Um, the uh, barium atom uh, and titanium atoms, if they were exactly equally spaced in the cubic structure, this would be exactly 0 0.5, but it's not exactly so. And the C over A ratio is about 1% uh, different from the ideal cubic one. In lead titanate, the C over A ratio is about 6% different from the ideal one. Um, in this table, I don't have the polarization, but you can see that the displacements of the atoms are much further away from the one half position. So in lead titanate, you have a more extreme version of uh, a displacement of the, um, of the material. And most of the ferroelectrics that are used in real life, like the ones in ultrasonic um, medical imaging are based on lead-based, um, uh, lead-based, um, uh, lead titanate based uh, perovskites, but with other things mixed in. Um, so um, how do we get a handle on this uh, polarization question? Um, uh, what I showed there was just for the um, ground state structure. So the ground state structure is the one where the polarization is, let's say, in the up direction. Um, we can uh, calculate the energy uh, in the high symmetry um, centrosymmetric structure and the energy difference in this case um, is the difference is the barrier height. And we can uh, do a calculation where the atoms are moved in steps and minimize, you know, relax other coordinates and calculate energy versus um, plotted versus polarization. And so we can we can calculate explicitly from density functional theory this double well potential, which is a very useful thing uh, to have. And of course, the polarization here is calculated by this Berry phase or uh, YNA center formulation that I talked about in the last lecture. Um, now, here's the story about finite temperature. These materials are really interesting. Um, at high temperature, the titanium atom is rattling around so much that it stays on the average in the center of the octahedron. And so on the average, the, the, the structure is cubic. Uh, the three lattice constants, A, B, and C, are equal. So that's this, um, uh, this, um, this, this color represents the cubic phase. And then when I cool the system down at about 120 Celsius, it goes into the tetragonal phase. What happens is, the titanium atoms on the average displace upwards or else downwards uh, or else in one of the other four Cartesian directions. And But if it goes in the z direction, then the c axis is larger than the a and b axes are equal. And so uh, on the scale over here, this is really only a, about a, a percent uh, or two difference uh, in lattice constant. But, but so you got a, a distortion. Um, the uh, center curve here is the average uh, lattice constant. Uh, and then as the temperature goes below about uh, zero degrees Celsius, it goes into an orthorhombic phase where the polarization is pointing in a 1-1-0 direction. It's pointing towards an edge of the cube. And then finally, at low temperature, the polarization points in the 1-1-1 direction. It's pointing towards a corner of the cube. And in that case, uh, the three lattice constants, A, B, and C, are again the same. And so this is all experimental data. And uh, what we asked ourselves, and this was done in collaboration with Karen Rabe at Rutgers um, and Wei Ching Zhang at the time, uh, postdoc. Uh, what we asked ourselves is, 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 can we reproduce this ferroelectric phase transition sequence from uh, density functional uh, calculations? 
but obviously we need to put in temperature somehow. So if I concentrate first of all on zero temperature, this isn't zero, but zero is down. So it, it stays in the rhombohedral phase all the way down to zero Kelvin. So uh, if you, um, if you uh, compute for eight different materials in this class, for each one of them, we computed the ground state structure assuming a five atom primitive unit cell, but allowing any kind of strain. Um, these, uh, these ones became ferroelectric rhombohedral. This was fer ferroelectric te tetragonal. This one was cubic. And then we compared with experiment. So in some cases, the experimental unit cell is just the five atom primitive unit cell. And in all cases, we get the correct ground state structure in those cases. In other cases, <clears throat> the uh, experimental ground state structure is something more complicated. This AFD-T is a tetragonal structure. AFD stands for antiferrodistortive, in which the octahedra rotate in an anti-sense going from one unit cell to the next, and so on and so on. So, so these are other possibilities. This is an antiferroelectric structure that involves um, a, a, a larger enlargement of the unit cell. So the basic story here is that if the experimental unit cell is simple, we correctly obtain the correct ground state structure from DFT. Okay, but now we wanna go uh, uh, to finite temperature and see if we can understand this phase transition sequence. Uh, what have I done? I've gone the wrong way. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, in order to do finite temperature simulations, you typically have to take into account the statistics correctly by doing some kind of molecular dynamic simulation or Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, we did Monte Carlo simulations, but on what? If you try to do a Monte Carlo simulation on some big, let's say six by six by six supercell containing a thousand atoms, uh, it, and then on every, um, every time step you calculate all the forces on all the atoms from first principles, even today that's not doable. So, um, uh, so what we did was to do a two-stage approach where we calculate energies and forces on a database of tens or 20 or 30 different distorted structures. From those DFT results, we build a model that's called an effective Hamiltonian. And then we do density functional calculations, uh, sorry. And then we uh, do um, Monte Carlo or molecular dynamic simulations on that effective Hamiltonian uh, model. And the, the, um, uh, the effective Hamiltonian is, is basically a classical simulation in which um, the degrees of freedom have to do with sublattice displacements of, of atoms in a way that represents a polar uh, polar phonon mode. So uh, I decided not to include a detailed discussion of this in the talk. I can talk more about it in the questions if you like. The um, uh, a 1995 paper um, um, is the one where we first did this and presented these, these plots. These plots are our calculations of this first principles based, so DFT based effective Hamiltonian classical model uh, Monte Carlo simulation as a function of temperature. And um, what's plotted here are the polarization components in the X, Y, and Z directions. And you see that as you cool the system, you first get polarization in the X direction, and then you get polarization in the X and Y direction, and then you get all three. And when you plot the lattice constants, you get lattice constants that look something like uh, the figure that I had here. This is experiment. This is on the right-hand side is theory. If we, uh, if we put these uh, on top of each other, uh, this, is the, this is the comparison of experiment and theory. Um, the, the vertical scales uh, are effectively uh, the same. Uh, here it's uh, plotted in terms of strain. Here it's plotted in terms of unit cell parameter. Uh, the horizontal scales have been aligned. So you can't tell it, but this is temperature Kelvin and this is temperature Celsius. So I've aligned everything correctly on the horizontal scale. And so what you see is that in the density functional theory calculation, the, um, <clears throat> uh, 
cubic to tetragonal phase transition is almost 100 degrees Celsius too low. But we do get the right phase transition sequence. We get cubic to tetragonal to orthorhombic to rhombohedral. Uh, we get the right um, general uh, qualitative behavior. Uh, the main thing that we uh, get wrong is that the transition temperatures are off by a significant amount. Uh, and uh, one reason for this is that the effective Hamiltonian model that I, uh, I didn't really have time to describe, uh, it does not include uh, thermal expansion. So part of what's going on in the experiment is that as you raise the temperature, the average lattice constant is getting larger. In the theory, that's not happening. Even worse, as a matter of fact, in the theory, the average lattice constant gets a little bit smaller as you raise the temperature. Um, and so in later work, um, we applied some um, corrections to include, uh, uh, include the uh, thermal expansion. And then these um, uh, discrepancies in the transition temperatures get reduced. They don't completely go away. Uh, but, you know, the, the theory is a first principles theory with no experimental input other than perhaps a, a little fudge about uh, putting in the experimental uh, lattice constant instead of the theoretical equilibrium lattice constant. And so the fact that we get the right phase transition sequence and qualitatively right behavior and semi-qualitatively right transition uh, temperatures um, um, uh, is fairly satisfactory, okay? Um, uh, in the intervening years, people have uh, developed more sophisticated and more accurate effective Hamiltonian methods that get uh, closer to the correct uh, phase transition uh, temperatures. Okay, so I've got about 20 minutes left and I wanna try to do 10 minutes on this class of hexagonal ferroelectrics and 10 minutes on the corundum ferroelectrics. And um, I, I, might, I might skip the second one if I have to, but so let me talk about this work about hexagonal ferroelectrics. So I told you that the perovskite class of ferroelectrics are the most uh, widely used today and, and that's still true, um, uh, but um, it would be very nice to have other new classes of ferroelectrics to explore. And uh, one class of ferroelectrics that, um, that we, <clears throat> and we being this uh, group, uh, Joe Bennett and Kevin Garrity were postdocs at Rutgers, Karen Rabe is my um, uh, faculty uh, collaborator at Rutgers. Uh, um, uh, there's a class of materials that have this um, uh, structure, um, uh, wurtzite structure. So zinc oxide is an example of the wurtzite structure, which is uh, uh, pretty much um, uh, uh, a tetrahedrally bonded structure in which um, the zinc atoms and the oxygen atoms are essentially fourfold coordinated. <clears throat> and um, uh, this is a polar material because on every vertical bond, you have, let's say, an oxygen on, on the top and a zinc on the bottom. Um, but it's not ferroelectric because it, it's not possible to, if you apply an electric field, an external electric field, you might apply a force on this atom in the direction to change the uh, buckling of the layer, but it's much too strongly buckled. You, you can't you can't interchange the position of the atoms. You can't switch the polarization. So in order to switch the polarization, you basically have to break and reform covalent bonds and that costs too much energy. Uh, however, uh, there's a lot of materials, there's a, a large number of materials that are in uh, this class or a related class of structures where these are not covalently bonded materials. They're more intermetallics, some of which are not uh, metallic, and some of which are insulating. And so um, uh, most of the materials that I'll be talking about are in this, uh, what's called a stuffed wurtzite structure. So the green atoms are something like uh, lithium, usually a first row uh, cation, um, could be a second row cation. And then the other atoms um, uh, make up um, the uh, wurtzite-like uh, structure. So it's an ABC chemical formula. And many of these, the buckling is weaker so that it becomes possible to reverse the buckling by external electric field. 
if it's an insulator. So if it's an insulator and if the barrier is not large, uh, this could be a ferroelectric. So in this work, um, this was uh, really led by Joe. Uh, what he did was investigate a very large number of potential compounds. Uh, uh, he, uh, first of all, he looked for existing compounds that have the chemical formula ABC and found about 4,000 of them in the ICSD, Inorganic Crystal Structure Database. And then of those that were uh, in this uh, stuffed wurzite structure that I showed here, um, he found 120. So we did calculations on all 120 of them, or, or at least the non-magnetic ones, and, um, and found, uh, first of all, look for ones that could be insulating and where the barrier for reversal is small enough that they would be ferroelectric. So this is an example of what's called high throughput search using density functional calculations. So um, uh, here's a list of some of these known compounds. Um, uh, this notion 134 means that the A, B, and C atoms come from column one, column three, and column four of the periodic table. And um, uh, the numbers in parentheses are experimental lattice constants. This is a C lattice constant. These are internal coordinates. So again, you see the density functional theory reproduces the structure pretty well. These are relaxed TFT calculations. Uh, this column is the band gap. So most of these are metals and only a couple of them were insulators. And uh, the last column I think is the barrier height. Yeah, delta E is the barrier height that you have to overcome uh, to go from one structure to another. So, uh, so there are these two materials here the lithium and the, um, the lithium beryllium and the lithium zinc uh, antimonide are potential uh, ferroelectrics, um, but we wanted to see if we could find more. All of these were known crystals, and uh, part of what we wanted to do was go beyond the known crystals, do a high throughput search for other materials that might belong to this class that might be candidates for experimental attempts at synthesis. So again, uh, uh, Joe did a search over a relatively large number of uh, compounds using these constituents, uh, checked which ones are insulating, uh, which one of them relaxed to the structure that we're interested in, and uh, found a total of uh, 17 candidates th this way. Here's just one of them. This is sodium magnesium phosphorus. This is the double well potential the height of the double well potential is only about uh, 200 milli electron volts, which is small enough. It's comparable to other ferroelectrics. Um, so this is a potential uh, new material. Uh, yeah, that barrier height is comparable to what it is in, in lead titanate. So uh, the sodium magnesium phosphorus is a, a, a reasonable candidate. Uh, altogether, there were a number of other uh, reasonable candidates um, uh, again, there's too much data here uh, to follow everything, but um, uh, all of these are insulating materials, which means that the gap is positive. These are the energy barriers, and the green emphasis is on ones that have relatively small energy barriers. And this is the size of the polarization, the very phase polarization. They're all sort of a comparable, roughly comparable magnitude there. So uh, this is a plot of for all these um, uh, materials. Uh, these were the two uh, no previously known materials, uh, but delta E again is the barrier height, and the, these guys have a pretty large barrier height. Um, but we found uh, nine promising candidates that have a much smaller barrier height and still have substantial polarization, and uh, so we're proposing that these be investigated as potential. Um, uh, new uh, potential ferroelectrics. Uh, there's some difficulties here. Some of these some of these materials actually, the ground state structure is not is not this uh, lithium gallium structure. It's a different structure. So you'd have to make a metastable crystal in this structure. But but some of them are not. Um, and uh, we also have the possibility of playing with uh, external tuning parameters like strain and chemical substitution um, to get better materials. Um, what's happened is it, it turns out that 
in this class of materials, even though they're nominally insulating, the uh, conductivity is not small enough to make them really practical ferroelectrics. So at the end of the day, although some groups have tried to synthesize these materials and check their ferroelectric properties, um, it, it wasn't as successful as we had hoped um, because the materials are too electrically leaky, um, possibly with better um, improvements in growth uh, techniques that can be improved. Um, okay, in the last uh, few moments, let me just give you a hint about this uh, corundum ferroelectrics. Th there are two well-known corundum ferroelectrics, lithium niobate and potassium niobate. Um, the corundum structure is the structure of aluminum oxide, which is, um, uh, it's garnet, I think. Anyway, um, it's composed of chains of atoms. Maybe it's easier to show it here. It, the, the, the lithium and niobium atoms are both in octahedral units, or in this case, it's aluminum uh, uh, in both places. So let me go to lithium niobate. So in lithium niobate, what was uh, aluminum and aluminum and aluminum oxide is lithium and niobium. Uh, uh, in this uh, arrangement, in a vertical column of uh, face sharing uh, octahedra. And you see that the inversion symmetry is broken here because the niobium atom is always above the lithium atom. But if the lithium atom could jump across um, this gap into the empty vacant octahedron below it, then I would have reversed the electric polarization. And in fact, it can. The lithium ion is mobile enough um, that it can do that. It basically has to migrate through this triangle of oxygens. The oxygens breathe out a little bit as the lithium goes through. And, um, and so um, you can switch lithium niobate from lithium up to lithium down by an external electric field. Um, lithium niobate is also useful as a nonlinear optical material, by the way. And so we were interested in exactly how this um, reversal occurs. Uh, the naive picture would be that the lithium, so there's a lithium hiding in the middle of this uh, purple uh, octahedron, uh, that the lithium would uh, move down. Um, the barrier uh, position would be for the lithium to be in a centrosymmetric position in the, um, well, a high, high symmetry position in the oxygen layer, and then, uh, and then would move down. And once it moved down, uh, we would be in the ferroelectric down state. So that's what, that's what we expected. And uh, we did the calculation and we found that's not what happens. Uh, so this was kind of interesting. Again, this is density functional calculations. The, um, what we did, I'll show you, is uh, we constrained the sum of the Z coordinates of the two um, lithium atoms compared to everything else. And when we adjust that constraint, what happens is the system chooses one lithium atom to go through the center and then go into the uh, vacant octahedron underneath. And the barrier structure is this funny structure in which the octahedra, there are three face sharing and then an isolated and then three face sharing and isolated. That's only halfway to the reverse structure. Then the other lithium atom uh, undergoes its migration and ends up in the bottom. So we actually mapped this out. These are the details of the density functional calculations. I think that's not interesting. We, we mapped this out. Here's how we did the calculation. There were two constraints. One constraint C1, or rather one variable C1 is the Z coordinate of the lithium relative to the oxygen average of the three oxygens. Uh, C2 is the other one for the two um, uh, units in the, in the unit cell. Um, and what we did is we constrained the sum of these two things. Uh, so we start when this uh, constraint value is one, it's in the up polarized ground state. When uh, the constraint uh, value is uh, minus one, when both of these Cs are minus one, it's in the down polarized state. So on this diagram, C1 runs vertically, C2 runs horizontally. The uh, up polarized state is this little red uh, box. And so we start there. And then what we do is we do a series of calculations where we constrain the sum of these two constraint variables to be uh, smaller and smaller. 
And as, as we do that, what happens first is that both of the lithium atoms uh, move down. They, they're kind of forced to move down by this constraint variable. And they do so at first uh, in equal amounts. And then something very uh, interesting happens. At a critical value of this constraint, the system decides that one of the lithium atoms would rather retreat and go back closer to where it started from, and the other lithium atom would go ahead and make its, its, its transition. So in this plot, uh, uh, horizontal axis is C2. C2 retreated, but C1 advanced. But there's also another path where it goes the other way. So the system decides whether to go this way or go this way. And then as it uh, continues, um, we can continue to push on this constraint variable. Uh, we go around the uh, nominal um, centrosymmetric structure that's the one we expected to uh, find was the barrier. And so <clears throat> the actual barrier configuration is, is over here. If the system decides to go this way, it turns out that the barrier configuration is this R3 bar structure, not the R3 bar C structure. This is, oops, this is the one that has the 3131 type of arrangement as you go up the, up the columns. So uh, that was a, a surprising result, uh, but it was important for obtaining correct values of the energy barrier for polarization reversal. Again, this was part of a larger study where we studied other materials um, uh, that were not known um, to see if we could find others that had small barriers. So in, in this set of materials, uh, the first two were previously known. These are unlikely because the barriers are too large. Uh, but um, we found uh, some candidates here where the energy barriers are, uh, are you know, comparable to, uh, to uh, lithium niobate. And so, and they have good polarization. So again, these are uh, new candidate uh, ferroelectrics. Um, okay, so uh, this is my uh, last slide, just to summarize everything. Um, uh, in the uh, study of the bulk perovskite ferroelectrics, I talked about the finite temperature application, which involves constructing this effective Hamiltonian. Then I talked about um, new classes of materials, novel, novel hexagonal uh, and corundum ferroelectrics. Um, in general, we would like to use high throughput density functional theory calculations to predict new and improved uh, ferroelectric materials. Um, the search space, uh, you know, material space is enormous, so we also need some good ideas as well as uh, having the uh, technical ability that uh, density functional theory and these um, highly developed codes uh, give us. Um, but um, I think the, um, uh, you know, uh, the bottom line is we still haven't found materials that are superior to the tried and true lead titanate based perovskite ferroelectrics. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the search space is, uh, large, and I think with new ideas and new search algorithms, um, it's possible. Uh, by the way, one of the um, goals in this field is just to re replace lead-based materials by lead-free materials, because lead is a toxic uh, substance in our environment. Um, and, and so uh, that's part of the motivation also. Even if you have a material that's not quite as good as lead titanate, but is lead-free, um, that would be very valuable. Okay, so uh, that concludes my uh, brief um, tour through uh, theory of ferroelectricity uh, in perovskites and related materials. And once again, I'll stop and, and take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, let's take some questions. Maybe you can uh, start with um, the earlier questions by uh, Im Kyung Ki. There is a uh, he asked four questions. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's from Samsung. Actually, the uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are huge interest in uh, industrial application of ferroelectric material including the audio questions, the uh, FET, and things like that. So I guess it's from Samsung, and he asked about, 
to go back. Maybe, uh, so which uh, which question would you like? <laughs> which question? Uh, yeah, so uh, four, four questions. Yeah, at the end uh, of the first the four uh, questions. Sure. Thank you for yeah. a great lecture. That one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, we need to. We can start from there. Uh, so there was the. Oh, where is one so and two? Can, oh, that was earlier. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So we stop there, yeah. Oh, I have two technical questions. Uh, to get Born effective charge, the chain of, change of polarization value is prerequisite. I think I answered that. Yeah, yeah, you can move on, yes, that's right. Is, so that's is the reference, ah, is the reference structure for calculating the change of polarization based on modern theory of polarization, paraelectric structure or the structure that has same lattice parameter with paraelectric structure, but centrosymmetric? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, the simplest case is where the unit cell dimensions don't change um, uh, as the polarization is turned on. So in other words, if the centrosymmetric paraelectric structure and the ferroelectric structure have the same cell shape and same cell parameters, um, then everything is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, so you use the reference structure um, uh, in that way. Um, if the, um, uh, but in fact, uh, more real realistically, what happens is that the cell shape does change. So for example, I explained that when you go into a, a ferroelectric state, the C over A ratio changes a little bit. Um, the, uh, the way to handle that is that the, um, the polarization uh, can be represented in terms of internal coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. So when you calculate the polarization in Cartesian coordinates, you calculate the dipole moment in Cartesian coordinates and divide by the cell volume in Cartesian coordinates. And because the cell volume is changing, uh, that makes things complicated. If you go entirely into internal coordinates, where everything is dimensionless uh, as fractions of a lattice vector and so on. And in fact, the dimensionless form of the polarization really is the Berry phase because that's a dimensionless object. And then you look at the changes of those things with respect to a centrosymmetric structure, then it doesn't really matter anymore if a centrosymmetric structure has exactly the same um, uh, cell shape. So, um, you know, in general, you just, the, the other thing I, I guess I should mention is that there are some unusual cases like uh, um, uh, like uh, uh, bismuth ferrite, uh, where the centrosymmetric structure, <laughs> the centrosymmetric structure is actually metallic. And so um, uh, that introduces some extra problems. So you have to choose a sort of a fictitious centrosymmetric structure. Um, okay, so yeah, you can move on to the uh, case number three. three. Um, yeah. The value of electronic polarization calculated by Berry phase or Weinerkamp is always less than the value of ionic polarization. No, no. I mean, the thing is that the I, I didn't um, I didn't emphasize this in the formulation, but um, you always have to calculate both the electronic contribution and the elect both the electronic contribution and the ionic contribution. And both of them have, a, have this quantum of uncertainty because, for example, when you talk about, let's say you're talking about uh, a barium titanate, the position of the titanium atom, you can say it's at one half, one half, one half, but you could also say it's at minus one half, one half, one half. And if you use those two different definitions, then the ionic polarization changes by a quantum. And the uh, same thing is true about the electronic contribution. So you can't really say which one of them is larger or smaller. You just have to add both of them together. Um, and then typically uh, what you do uh, in order to choose the right branch choice, the right kind of quantum, or the, the reasonable one is to you know, connect it to the center, nearby centrosymmetric structure, which is uh, centrosymmetric and is therefore zero. So. Um, okay, so uh, there was a last question from uh, the same person. Oh. Why the spontaneous polarization calculated by DFPT is well correlated to experimental values, though the dielectric constant calculated by DFPT 
is far from experimental value, especially for ferroelectrics. Um, the uh, the uh, dielectric constant, there are two dielectric constants. There's the uh, purely electronic dielectric constant that you get when you freeze the atomic coordinates. And then when you include uh, the lattice degrees of freedom. So in other words, you apply an electric field. If you freeze the ions, if you freeze the coordinates and only let the electrons respond, that's the purely electronic response. Um, that's what's usually called epsilon for dielectric constant. Epsilon infinity, um, uh, that's the purely electronic one. Infinity means that frequency is high compared to phonon frequencies. And then epsilon zero, that's what happens when you apply a static electric field and you allow the atoms to uh, relax. Uh, that's the ionic, um, uh, uh, well, that's the lattice contribution to the dielectric constant. So DFT does a pretty good job of the purely electronic dielectric constants. Um, we have some errors in gap and that introduces some errors in dielectric constants, but I think they're usually correct within 10 or 15 or 20%. Um, but in a material like uh, ferroelectrics, this lattice uh, contribution is very large and very temperature dependent because we're near these structural phase transitions. And that's very difficult to get correct within density functional theory. So um, the, um, uh, right, so, so, so basically the, the difficult problem is when the structural coordinates depend very sensitively on external electric field. That's an additional problem, especially at finite temperature that has to be taken into account. Yeah, so maybe we have too many questions. Maybe you can go through and uh, select uh, the, uh, the questions that you like. Uh, what do you think of using machine learning? Um, inter okay, so um, uh, I'm, I'm re responding here to some Sungum Kang, um, he suggests um, using machine learning interatomic potentials for molecular dynamics. Um, there are a couple of groups, uh, uh, Andrew Rapp's group at University of Pennsylvania and Jorge Iniguez and collaborators, um, uh, he's based in uh, Luxembourg, um, have, uh, have worked hard to develop sophisticated um, um, uh, interatomic potentials uh, that uh, do a much better job than the simple effective Hamiltonians that I described. Um, whether those are based upon machine learning, uh, exactly, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that there have been um, developments in using machine learning uh, for interatomic potentials um, in other areas, so I think it's an excellent idea. And um, but. Um, uh, you know, I, I would check the literature from the RAP group and Indigas and co-workers um, uh, to see what's been done there. Can we say the nonpolar structure of lithium niobate as antiferroelectric instead of ferroelectric? Um, antiferroelectric um, is a rather specific thing. Uh, antiferroelectric doesn't refer to a particular structure. Uh, when you're at the, the barrier structure, that's a particular structure. And it's actually probably was not very good of me to call that a, 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 a paraelectric structure because it's really just a nonpolar structure. Um, what is an antiferroelectric? An antiferroelectric is a material that has instead of a, a double well potential, it has a triple well uh, triple well potential. So, uh, do I have time? How, how am I doing? Can I can I share my share my uh, Share my uh, iPad again. I talk to you also, we have enough time, but then uh, you must be getting tired. <laughs> um, so an antiferroelectric uh, is something where the energy landscape looks something like this. So I've got a, a minimum, a minimum, and a real minimum. So this is nonpolar. Uh, sorry. So this is nonpolar. 
uh, or antipolar. So typically what this means is that it has uh, dipoles that alternate up and down. In this one, the dipoles all point up. In this one, the dipoles all point down. So the ground state structure is uh, nonpolar, but if I apply an electric field to this system, I tend to drive it into a higher polarization state. This is polar polarization going this way. So if I apply an electric field in this direction, I can put it into this state. So what happens is that I get a, a hysteresis loop. If this is polarization and this is uh, electric field, I get a double uh, hysteresis loop. So uh, this is the up polarized state. This is the down polarized state. This is the non polarized state. And so what I'm drawing here is as I increase the electric field, I can put myself in this uh, polarized up state. If I take the electric field down, I go back to the nonpolar state and then I go to the polarized down state. So it's a three state device instead of a two state device. So, um, so the term antiferroelectric is not something that applies to a particular structure. It's something that applies to a material that has this kind of energy landscape. Okay, David, uh, so uh, actually time uh, is more or less up. Uh, we have a more time, but then uh, I don't want to... Okay, maybe you can text the last question, maybe, uh, then, if it's okay with you. Um, let's see. Uh, is there an antiferroelectric to, to paraelectric phase transition? No, lithium niobate does not have an antiferroelectric phase. Um, what do you think of applying machine learning? I got that. Um, is there examples of ferroelectricity of electronic density while well, you introduce some ferroelectricity of ionic contribution? Well, that's an interesting question. This is the last one. Um, um, the one way of asking the question is, could there be a situation where even without moving the atoms, even keeping the atom coordinates fixed, the electronic system would have two metastable minima, one where the electron charge is displaced up and the other one where it's displaced down. Um, uh, if that exists, that would be what people refer to as a charge ordered ferroelectric. And um, there have been investigations of that. Um, it's a controversial subject because there are some materials that seem to behave like that. But the fact is that when the electronic polarization is up, there's always got to be some change of the lattice coordinates. So experimentally, there's always, in addition, some uh, shift of the atomic coordinates. And when the polarization goes down, they shift the other way. And then people argue about whether it's you know, uh, really driven by the electronic uh, instability or whether it's uh, really driven by the lattice instability. Um, the class of materials in which you're most likely to find something like this is a mixed valent system in which you have a, an atom that can be two plus and three plus, and then they can trade places so that now this one is three plus and that one is two plus. So a mixed valent system or um, uh, a charge ordered uh, system where, well, it's really the same thing. Um, well, you know, where, for example, uh, uh, the system can prefer to occupy dz squared orbitals or dx squared minus dy squared orbitals in, in different patterns. Um, a pattern can generate, in some cases, an electric polarization. Um, so uh, there, have been there has been discussion of so-called uh, charge-ordered ferroelectrics. There's a nice review article about different um, ferroelectric and multiferroic materials by uh, Sangbuk Chong and collaborators that I can uh, give you a reference to if you're interested. Um, and it mentions charge-ordered um, as one class. Okay, then, um, so with that, I guess we can uh, close your lectures. Uh, so let's... Uh, thank you one more time and I really, really appreciate your uh, wonderful lectures and so okay. thank you.
Well, I appreciate. Thank you for the questions. Also, we uh, we get rid of this. I do appreciate uh, your interest and um, uh, and um, uh, thank you for your attention. So yeah, thank you for, for giving lectures in the evening. <laughs> so hope you have a nice evening over there. Yeah. Okay. So Good. hopefully see you soon in Korea after okay. the coronavirus is over. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh,